thank you for the preservation of life. And we thank you that you are good to everyone and your goodness will affect and will come and influence and impact every life today in Jesus' name. Wipe all the tears of your people away. Those who are sorrowful, make them glad. And those who are mourning, cheer them up. Let the song of praise be in every mouth in Jesus' name. Sunshine, glory, praises, rejoicing in every heart, even from today in Jesus' name. Even when people see they have got to their last day, praying their last prayer, and thinking the end has come, a new beginning will start in your life in Jesus' name. Confirm it, Lord, in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Today we are praising the Lord and we are purposefully praising God and we need to be doing that every day till the end of our lives. Today the Lord will start you on a new road, on a new journey, with a new attitude and with the songs of praise in your mouth in Jesus' name. Look at Psalm 145, verse 1 and verse 2. It says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name, how long? Forever and ever. Look at verse 2. It says, every day, every day, will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. In Psalm 34, reading from verse 1, Psalm 34, verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times, at all times, at all times, I will bless the Lord. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And then in verse 2, it says, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Verse 3 tells us, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Psalm 119, verse 33. 119, verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end, unto the end. I shall keep it. Am I praying unto the end? Am I praising the Lord unto the end? Am I serving the Lord unto the end? Am I, am I giving myself to the service of the Lord until the end? I will keep it unto the end. Verse 112. In verse 112, I have inclined my heart to perform that statutes always, even unto the end perform the statutes of the lord the commandment of the lord even unto the end today as we're talking about praising god we're talking on the subject purpose fully praising god every day till the end the three points we're looking at number one the heart of appropriate unblemished praises with godliness. We're praising the Lord from the heart. We're praising the Lord from the depth of our inward, innermost soul. Praising the Lord with appropriate, unblemished praises with godliness all from the heart. Number two, the history of acceptable and unacceptable praises to God. There's a history of praising the Lord. There are people who have praised the Lord before, acceptable. Other people praise unacceptable. And we look at the history and then we're able to draw a conclusion how we should be praising the Lord. Number three, the height of ascending or seizing praises for God's glory. All we do 
We're singing for God's glory. We're praising for God's glory. We're giving thanks for God's glory. We're rejoicing for God's glory in the church, at home, in the marketplace, anywhere. Everything we do, including praising the Lord, is all for God's glory. Let's look at number one. Number one is uh, the heart of appropriate unblemished praises with godliness and let's look at isaiah chapter 25 we're reading from verse 1 isaiah 25 verse 1 oh lord thou art my god that's a saved soul that's not a drunkard that's not a smoker that's not a person that is still living in sin that's not a goat in the sight of the Lord. It's a person who has surrendered his life. He says, my God, it's a person who has repented and turned around and he gave himself to the Lord. And therefore he can say, my God. A drunkard cannot say, my God. An unsafe person cannot say, my God. In a real gospel way, in a gracious way, a person who is still living and serving the devil cannot say, my God. Before our praises will be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. You must have repented. You must have separated from sin and from the world and from evil. And then you know that you're in the family of God and you can say, I'm born again, I'm saved, I'm transformed, I'm a child of God, and God is my heavenly Father. He says, O oh Lord, thou art my God. I will extol thee, I will play, praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Salvation, wonderful healing wonderful freedom from sin wonderful the liberty to serve the lord without hypocrisy in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life that's the wonderful thing he has done he has redeemed us he has saved us he has sanctified us he has made us holy he has made us new creatures in christ he has healed us he has delivered us he has reached our name in the book of life in heaven he has done wonderful things thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth it tells us in psalm 138 verses 1 and 2 psalm 138 verse 1 i will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. And then in verse 2, it tells us, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. And then in verse 8, it says, in verse 8, the Lord will perfect thy that which concerneth me. 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 Say it now. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. That thing you are concerned about, the Lord will perfect it in your life today. Thy mercy, O Lord, endure it forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. It will not forsake you. In the time of trouble, time of trial, and in the time of sickness, and time of any pressure upon your life, it will not forsake you. When you are poor, when you need money, when you need things that will bless your life, the Lord will not forsake you. When your father and your mother, when your friends and your acquaintances, when they don't remember you, and when they forget you, the Lord will always remember you. In the day and in the night, it will answer your prayer. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, our praise for the provision of the unsearchable God. We're praising Him because it's the unfathomable God, unsearchable God, and He has made abundant provision for us. Number two, the power and perfection 
of the unchangeable God. It's not changing. His love has not changed. His power has not changed. And His goodness has not changed. Even today, you'll find the fullness of the goodness of God in your life in Jesus' name. Number three, the peculiarity of people praising with unreprovable godliness. Let's look at number one there. Number one there, our praise for the provision of the unsearchable God. Look at Psalm 145, verse 3. Psalm 145, verse 3. Great is the Lord. Your God is great. I said our God is great. And you'll find him great. He's never lost his power. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. His greatness is unsearchable. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, it tells us the Lord is good to how many people? The Lord is good, I said, to how many people? Who is going to experience the, the goodness of God here today? Where is he? Where is she? He'll be good to you in Jesus' name. And as he went out, the Lord Jesus went out doing good and he heal, healing all, everyone, everyone. He wants to save all. He wants to deliver all. He wants to bless all. He wants to put the joy and happiness of service in the heart of everyone. You will not be an exception. Your wife will not be an exception. Your husband will not be an exception. And the whole family, you'll not be an exception in Jesus' name. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. You will have your own share. Look at Psalm 68, verse 19. In Psalm 68, we're looking at verse 19. It says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us. Who daily loadeth us. With what? I said with what? With benefit. It will load you today with blessing. Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Once you settle that area of salvation, you turn away from your sin, you repent, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died for you on the cross of Calvary. You say, Lord, I leave all my sins, I leave all the works of Satan, I leave all the works of darkness, and I move away from all those dirty things of the world, and I look at Christ who died for me, Lord, I believe that you lived a perfect life, you died for me, you were buried on the third day, you rose again just for me. I accept the salvation. Salvation is yours. I said salvation is yours. And then from that point on, everything you need, ask, seek, and knock, and the Lord will load your blessings in Jesus' name. Point number two there, in number two is the power and perfection of the unchangeable God. The power and the perfection of the unchangeable God. In Psalm 147, I'm reading from verse 3, He healed the broken in heart. He healed, he healed before, he will heal in the future, and today he's still healing. And if you're sick there, any part of your life, from the top of your head to the tip of your toe, in your body, in your soul, in your spirit, is healing you today. You will not carry sickness away from the presence of God in Jesus' name. And bind us up their wounds. If you have been wounded, if you have been crushed, the Lord will bind up your wounds in Jesus' name. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, great is our Lord, and of great power is understanding is infinite. It says it's unsearchable in Psalm 145, and now it says in Psalm 147, it is infinite. You cannot get to the end of it. And that infinite power, 
that immeasurable power that unsearchable power so great and so high and so broad and so deep will walk in every life in jesus name look at psalm 148 i'm reading from verse 1 in psalm 148 verse 1 praise ye the lord praise ye the lord from the heavens praise him in the heights verse 2 tells us it says praise ye him all his angels praise him all his hosts have you noticed that praise him all his angels god created myriads of angels innumerable number of angels then the head called lucifer went away from the lord he wanted to compete with the almighty god and he drew one thought of the angels after him those people those angels they cannot praise god in rebellion they cannot praise god in disobedience they cannot praise god in their satanic nature they cannot praise god now the psalmist is talking to the holy angels that remain and the obedient angels that remain the loyal faithful angels that remain satan he cannot praise god and the thought of the angels that followed him cannot praise god the same thing with us if we are submissive unto him if we're sanctified if we're children of god if we're living holy if we're totally surrendered in our soul in our mind in our spirit unto him we'll be like those holy angels and we can praise the lord but if we follow after Lucifer, as those evil angels followed after Lucifer, and then they're doing the they're doing the work of Satan, they could not praise God. If we're following after Satan, if we're following after darkness, if we're following after evil, if we're sinful in our soul, in our tongue, with our action, the sinners like those fallen angels cannot praise God. But if we remain committed unto the Lord, praise ye him, all his angels, praise ye him, all his hosts. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us there, it says, fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word anything that comes near your life or into your life it will bring the praise of god the fire will bring the praise of god the hail will bring the praise of the snow will bring the praise of god the vapor will bring the praise of god the stormy wind look at that let us go to the other side they are coming to the other side and then jesus got into the boat and then uh, disciples also got there into the boat and they were rowing they were looking at the shore they were looking at the destination to the other side and then uh, stormy wind arose bringing water into the ship and then they woke him up master master carest not thou that were perish and then he rose up he will rise up for you and then peace but still everything came to a calm that fire in your family everything will be quenched and that hill falling down everything will stop right there and the stormy wind in your life everything will come to an end you will praise the lord and then everything came to a calm and they were amazed they were surprised what manner of man is this that even the stormy wind obey him every storm in your life will obey the word of the lord in jesus name fulfilling his word fulfilling his word the word of god in your life will be fulfilled every time no matter what is happening in jesus name look at uh, uh, psalm 62 we're looking at verse 11 psalm 62 we're looking at verse 11 god has spoken once he has spoken to my life I say, God has spoken to my life. Say it for yourself. 
God has spoken once, twice, have I had this, the power belongeth unto God. Power belongeth unto God. Power belongeth unto God. There's no mountain so heavy in your life that that power will not remove and there is no sorrow that is so deep in your life that that power will not uh, stop everything negative in your life power belongs unto God he'll set you free in Jesus name number three now number three the peculiarity of people praising with unreproachable godliness we're looking at Psalm 135 we're reading from verse 4 the peculiarity the peculiarity of the people that are praising the Lord they are peculiar they're not like Egyptians they're peculiar they're not like the Canaanites they're peculiar they're not like the Chaldeans they're peculiar they're not like Pharisees and Sadducees they're saved that's what makes them peculiar if you're going to praise God acceptably that peculiarity of the people of God must be in your life in Psalm 135 verse 4 for the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar peculiar treasure for his peculiar treasure exodus chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 5 exodus 19 verse 5 now therefore if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant then he shall be a peculiar treasure unto me a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine all the earth is mine by creation. But then those who are saved and those who are redeemed and those who are taken from this dirty world and they come and they put their faith in this only begotten son and a new life then comes, he says, all those people, it's not just that he is creator, he is redeemer and by redemption by salvation by conversion they become the peculiar treasure of the lord and then in verse 6 it tells us in verse 6 and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of praise and an holy nation not a defiled nation and not a sinful nation, not a backsliding nation, not a falling nation, and not a lukewarm nation. A peculiar people, they'll be priests unto God. They'll be an holy nation. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. In Titus chapter 2 verse 14, who gave himself that Jesus Christ, he died for you on the cross, so you'll be saved, number one, so you'll be sanctified, number two. He, he died on the cross, so that number one, you'll be pardoned all your sins. Number two, you'll be purified. He died on the cross so that it will set you free, number one. Number two, you'll be free and free indeed, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify and sanctify and purge and make holy and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works a peculiar people you know peculiar people they're not like every day can hurry every day can hurry in the world they're tired they're weary they're sluggish they're just pushing on in life it's like they're going to give up even the next minute but peculiar people when the fire of the holy ghost comes upon you you are saved you are sanctified and you are baptized and the holy ghost and the fire is burning and all the chaff is burnt out of your life you become so peculiar that whatever your age and whatever your disposition you become zealous of good works you become zealous in evangelism and zealous in soul winning and zealous in serving the lord when they say let us go into the house of the lord and worship the lord they spring under your feet and you're moving on with energy and excitement because you're a peculiar person in the sight of the lord and you're zealous of 
good works. I pray that the zeal of the Lord will never leave your life in Jesus' name. Then in First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation. The Lord has chosen me. I said, The Lord has chosen me. Say it for yourself now. Like he chose Moses, he has chosen you. Like he chose Aaron, he has chosen you. Like he chose Joshua, peculiar, special, he has chosen you. Like he chose David in, the, in his family of many children, he singled you out, and the Lord has chosen you. Aren't you happy? Aren't you grateful? Like he chose Peter, like he chose Paul, he is a chosen vessel. And as you look at yourself today, while you are walking away after the service, and you look at yourself, I am chosen. I will do good in life, I am chosen. I am here for a purpose, I am chosen. Nothing can stop your journey until you finish what he has chosen you for in Jesus' name. If any weakness, any sickness, any infirmity is going to stop the purpose of your choice today, they come out of your life in Jesus' name. It says, but ye, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, a peculiar people, a peculiar people. Say that, a peculiar people. You know, the devil will want you to forget your peculiarity. You'll say, everybody is doing it, why don't you do it? I can't, I'm peculiar. Everybody is going there, why don't you go there? I can't, I'm peculiar. Everybody is feeling and they have to bribe, uh, you know, lecture whoever before they can make anything at all. I can't because I'm peculiar. I am peculiar. And anywhere you go, everywhere you go, your life, your language, your attitude, your conduct, your comportment, and your stature, everything will show that you are peculiar in Jesus' name. But ye, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye shall show forth the praises of him. Those are the only people that can show forth the praises of the Lord because they have been redeemed, they have been forgiven, their lives are no different, are now different, and because of that, they can offer praises unto him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Thank God that's true about you today. We're coming to number two now. Number two is the history of acceptable, unacceptable praises to God. As we look at all these Psalms, look at Psalm 145 verse 4. It says, one generation shall praise thy words to another and shall declare thy mighty as from this generation to this generation to that generation is the history of the praises of God. Look at Psalm 146 verses 1 and 2. Praise ye the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. Then in verse 2 it says, while I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Now, the history of praising the Lord, there were people that praised the Lord by singing. Doesn't, they don't make any movement, they don't do any other thing. They just open their mouth and they are singing new songs unto the Lord, even without instrument. They are praising the Lord. And in 146, I'm reading from verse 10, it says in verse 10, the Lord shall reign forever, even thy 
God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 147, reading from verse 10, He delighteth not in the strength of the horse. If you know the history of the people of old, in their history, there were some people that when they won, they, when they uh, won any battle, they will be on their horses like Alexander the Great, and then they will celebrate, they will decorate all those horses, and then they'll be making some acrobat, acrobat or some gymnastics, and they said they were praising God, and God said, I delight not in the strength of the horse, and he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. There were people that will, you know, they make their legs uh, different, different ways. Some of them will, when they were young, they will bend the, uh, the legs so they can have bow legs. Other people will wear some kind of stockings, uh, colorful things, and then some special shoes, high heel, low heel, or whatever. And they want to specially prepare for praising their gods. And God said, in the history of a praising God, he doesn't delight in the strength of the horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of a man or the legs of a woman. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him. While they are praising God, they look at what God wants, what God does not want, the attitude God wants and the attitude God does not want, and they fear Him. They are praising the Lord, but they want to honor Him in that place. They are praising the Lord, but they want to fear Him. They want to be obedient to His word, and they say, God doesn't appreciate that. We can't praise God and sin. We can't be praising God and lying. We cannot be praising God and praising idols. We cannot be praising God and going into darkness all those things God does not like God does not want they jettison them they forsake them because they fear the Lord while they are praising the Lord the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him in those that hope in his mercy Psalm 148 I'm reading from verse 1 praise ye the Lord praise ye the Lord from the heavens praise him in the heart it says Praise ye the Lord in the heavens, from the heavens. Now, when you are praising the Lord, you have to ask yourself, is this going to be done in heaven? Are the angels of God in heaven, in praising God, are they doing this in heaven? Is Jesus Christ, the very Son of God in heaven now, as he's praising the heavenly Father, is he doing this in heaven? You see the history of praising the Lord from heaven, then to Israel, to all the generations and to all the people. So, the praises of the Lord, they are what we call parameters. They have what we call the perimeter. They have the territory. How do they do it in heaven? How did the Israelites do it acceptably? The people that feared the Lord, and they're not just ministering to the flesh, how did they do it? And it says you praise the Lord from the heavens, you praise him in the heights. Look at verse 2 there. In verse 2, it tells us, praise him, all his angels. You see, the praises of the Lord has history. It is not just, uh, you know, the praises that people do here. You know, sometimes uh, we have had, uh, you know, the experience some people, uh, musicians of the nightclub, and they have their way of rejoicing. They, they don't say they are praising the Lord. They are just relaxing uh, and they are letting go all their frustrations and then a little bit of drinking, a little bit of of, uh, you know, womanizing a little bit of uh, this and that, and then the you know the drummers and the people will get there with the electronic guitar, electric guitar, and then they praise and praise and praise, and some of them they get converted and they come to a church or they start a church and. The things they were doing before, they didn't know that if any man be in Christ, all things pass away, all things become.
Palmer knew they bring the night club music into those assemblies they are setting up and they think that that is how to praise the Lord they have not studied the history of praising the Lord that they started with the angels of God in heaven and it says praise ye him all his angels and so you ask yourself is it by you know robbing bodies of boys and girls together and robbing bodies of men and women together is it by throwing their buttocks here and here and creating a sight is that how the angels do it in heaven we have to look at the history of praising the Lord so that we don't bring uh, you know fornication adultery and lust and immorality and sensuality into the house of God and then we're pretending that we're praising the Lord the angels did it and when they did it we look at the history how this one came in how that one comes in how that one comes in and when you look at music you must understand that there are different kinds of music you know there is singing in heaven that even the angels never knew because they didn't taste redemption but when I sing a redemption story angels fold their wings because they never knew the joy of redemption that's a kind of singing we're going to have redeemed souls and they're singing angels and they're singing and they have their praises and then have you known that you know the military when challenging them to put courage in them they have the kind of music the military does not play the nightclub music they play the martial music that will pump blood into their vein that will give them courage do you know that in the dentist if you go to do dentistry work to soothe the pain there's a kind of music they play there in the dentist place when they stretch up there and they're trying to you know puncture this and uh, remove this the music that will come you music has various levels and then there's classical music like the Messiah then there is the normal ordinary music like uh, you know Charles Wesley that he composed that were praised the Lord normally in hymns in churches and then there are worldly music there's worldly music and then as you know the history then you say that one is not for church that one is not for worshiping the lord that one is not acceptable to god because you are discerning praise ye him all his angels praise ye him all his hosts and now we come to psalm 149 i'm reading from verse 1 psalm 149 reading from verse 1 praise the lord sing unto unto the lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints and then in verse 2 it says let Israel rejoice in him that made him let the children of, of Zion be joyful in their king capital K in the king the one that is to come look at verse 3 here in verse 3 let them praise his name in the dance now you understand when we say when the bible says in the dance it's not the modern day dancing the modern day dancing had not come at that time when this was written in the dance and there are you know different kinds of dancing and the different kinds of steps in fact there are people there are some kinds of dancing you cannot have except to go for training there are people that have to go for training how they take the steps how they move how they swing and how they do all those things they have to be trained for that but that's the world but this one is talking about the Israel of God the people of God let them praise his name in the dance now 
we must ask ourselves the dancing that some people have in their various assemblies. Where did they get that? They got that from the nightclub. Exactly the kind of dancing they were having in the dancing halls, in the nightclubs, when they were still in the world. Now they say they are born again. And then some of those who are not even born again, they see that there's dancing over there. And it's exactly what they're doing in the nightclub. And they rush there and they say, that's my church. That's my kind of fellowship. There's liberty. There's freedom, and then they can do the dancing, not the dancing of the Bible. I'm sure you know that. It's not the dancing of holy people, righteous people, the saints of God. It's the dancing in the nightclub. And then they will look for their concordance and look for a word. And then they discovered Psalm 149, verse 3. It says, Let them praise his name in the dance. They said, I got a verse for what I'm doing now. They were doing something and they were looking for a verse to justify what they're doing. That's different. Somebody is preaching false doctrine and then is looking for a verse to justify the false doctrine. That's different. But you start with the Bible. Here is the Bible. How do we praise God? What do we praise God with? And with what attitude and heart do we praise God? You go from the Bible to practice, not from the practice, and then you are looking for something to justify what you are doing. Let them sing praises unto Him of the timbrel and harp. Let's come to Psalm 150. I'm reading from verse 4. It says, Praise Him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the beginning and bitterness of dancing in praises. Number two, the baseness and backsliding of dancing for pleasure, for pleasure. Number three, the burning and bondage of that defiled with pretenders. Look at number one there. We're looking at Exodus, Exodus chapter uh, 15, verse 20. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out. Miriam, a woman, and all the women went out after her. After, after the prophetess with timbrels and with dances. Now, if uh, there is any announcement in any of these nightclubs today, and they say that, you know, there's going to be dancing tonight, and then only women without men, without boys, old or young, no boy, no man will be there, only women. And then the person going to lead the dance tonight will have sought her out. She's called Miriam, a prophetess, and she is going to preach about repentance, about salvation. And then after that, it will lead the women in dancing. They will not have many people. Those who go to nightclubs and those who go to houses of dancing in worship, they, they are not interested in just women alone dancing. And then the prophetess leading them, don't throw your body like that. Don't get near to that person like that. That one will generate lesbianism. Don't do this, don't do that. They don't like that. They, they don't want commandment. They don't want restriction in their dancing. You see what happened here? This is the key history how it started Miriam and the women a prophetess and they're doing it to glorify God and not to exhibit their bust or their buttocks or anything it just to praise the Lord but look at verse 21 it says Miriam answered them sing ye to the Lord not to Moses sing ye to the Lord not to a politician sing ye unto the Lord not to the flesh for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and his rider as he thrown into the sea and then in verse 22 it tells us in verse 22 it said for Moses so Moses brought Israel forth from the Red Sea and
branch they went out into the wilderness of shore and they went three days in the wilderness look at this and they found no water and they found no water look at verse 24 now in verse 24 and the people murmured and the people murmured and the people murmured against Moses saying what shall we drink from the beginning and then the bitterness you know the people who take all the time dancing dancing they don't have chance to be taught the word of God by the time the preacher comes and he wants to preach it cannot go beyond 20 30 minutes why they're tired and the one that is interesting to them is the dancing and so they are not taught the one these people after the dancing then there was no water to drink they had not given time to being taught that in everything we praise God. When there's water, we praise God. When Pharaoh is defeated, praise God. And when we come out of that Red Sea, and then there's no water to drink now, and the one we even come to is bitter, is not drinkable, they don't know to praise God. All those people that say they are praising God, they are praising God, in all those assemblies where there's dancing, that's all they know. They don't understand the word of God. And when reverses came, when there's no water, when there's no job, when there's no health, when there is uh, nothing for them to eat, grumbling and murmuring, the dancing deprived them of being taught the word of God. Exodus chapter 32, I'm reading from verse 19. In Exodus chapter 32, we're looking at verse 19, and it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp that he saw the calf and, and the dancing. Moses went to the mountain top and then he spent 40 days there. By the time he came down, they had lost their conviction. By the time he came down, they had lost their faith. By the time he came down, they are totally backslidden and they have gone for idol worship. The people who are concentrating on dancing and dancing and throwing the body here and there, they don't have conviction. And when any little difficulty comes up and the pastor is not around or their Sunday school teacher is not around, they backslide and when there's nobody to encourage them or pump them up or lift them up they say i don't understand they don't even believe the bible anymore they've given so much time to dancing and the conviction of the word of god is not there and then it's only dancing and moses anger wax hot and he casts the tables out of his hand and break them Beneath, uh, beneath the mount. And then in verse 31, he tells us in verse 31, Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin. Check up. In all those places where the attention is only dancing, dancing, uh, with the teenagers and the young people, see the kind of life in those places, the immorality there, the fornication there, and even the breaking of families there, that these uh, young uh, dancers and worship leaders, even the worship leader himself, check up their history, check up what they're doing, they are not able to live a holy, righteous life. They're too much of the flesh and they're not of the spirit. Moses returned and said, Lord, oh, these people have seen a great sin and they have, and they have made them gods of gold. Verse 32 says, it says in verse 32, yet now, if thou will forgive their sin and if not, blot me, I pray thee, I out of thy book which thou hast written. Verse 33 And the Lord said unto Moses, so Ammon has sinned against me, him when I blot out of my book. All those people dancing, they sinned against me. They made a calf and instead of praising me and me alone, they are praising the calf of gold that they have brought up. All those people that have done that, I'm not interested in their dancing. That's idolatrous dancing. That's worldly dancing. That's sensual dancing. And that one is not to the glory of my name. I'm not interested in that. 
if you are interested in them, you are not interested in what God is interested in. And then they dress cantilly and part of those ladies, part of their upper part of their body, as they bend down like this, you can see everything. It's deliberate. It is to attract the attention of those men. And then they keep close together. They hug themselves and keep themselves to themselves. And then they say they are dancing. And then they are whispering some things into the ears of one another while they are doing that. God is not interested in that. That one is an assembly of sinful people. Assembly for sinful practice. It says they have seen a great sin. Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. The beginning and the bitterness of dancing in prison. I'm sure you remember they were coming from the uh, from the uh, from the uh, battlefield and then the women came out no men there just the women they came out and they were singing and they said Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousand the kind of songs the same kind of dancing and the kind of uh, you know merriment that puts hatred in the heart of Saul and from that day because of the dancing and the singing Saul eyed David from that day he, even in that same chapter chapter 18 he wanted to throw a javelin and kill him because of that have you seen people who are fighting over a lady? You know, one a he dances with this lady, and then the next time now another one comes dancing with her, and now there is jealousy, there is envy, and that lady is tending towards number two. When number one is still there and is saying, "I will marry you like we have danced together. Let us live together forever and be married." Married, and the other one that danced with her too uh, also wants to claim her jealousy comes, envy comes, fighting comes. And in the church, there's animosity. They're still attending the same church, and they're still dancing and dancing, but you know, they don't have a good heart towards each other. And so that kind of dancing brought a real terrible thing. When you get home, you can read Second Samuel chapter 6, reading from verse 14 all through to verse 23. What happened there is that the ark of the covenant of God was brought back to its to the place and then David was happy and when David was happy he forgot himself a king a king he became frivolous and then he was dancing and leaping and jumping and his outer coat was flying off and the women and everybody seen the under underwear of the king and so the king came home and then Michael had been waiting for him and said hmm, what a great thing the king did today in exposing his nakedness to the ladies in the land. Although David gave an excuse and said, uh, God chose me, uh, you know, before your father and all that. But it says in verse 23, and Michael had no child until the day of her death. You know what happened? David was so unhappy and so irritated by the criticism of Michael. After all, he had other women. He'll go to other women. Never came near that woman again. Just look at what the dancing has done for the family. That's the history of this dancing people are talking about in various places. It began well. It ended in being Bitterness. And I pray that the bitterness of worldly music will never come to our church in Jesus' name. Point number two there, number two there, the business and backsliding of dancing for pleasure. If you uh, look at um, uh, jo Job chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 11. They sent forth the little ones like a flock. 
their children dance. Those are not Christian people, righteous people, religious people. They're just people in the land. And one of the things they make or create for their children, they have a swimming pool at the back of the house. And they also have, uh, you know, music like you have in restaurants. Sometimes you can, in the restaurant, somebody is there is playing music, or not for dancing, classical music most of the time. But there are people that have, you know, kind of uh, things they make for their children and their children dance and those children they get used to dancing and any church and any assembly where there's no dancing for them is dull hearing the word of god is dull sitting and jesus christ on the mount on the mount preaching the sermon on the mount and there's no singing there's no dancing and jesus just he opened his mouth and began to tell them blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of god blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted and blessed that the meek for they shall inherit in the hand. Blessed are the pure in heart because they shall see God. Blessed are those when they are persecuted, they are rejoicing because great is your reward in heaven. And then those the children that used to dancing, they look around, there's no drumming, there's no dancing, there's nothing at all. They said, what kind of service is this? Even the service of Jesus, when Jesus is the shepherd, is the pastor, is the teacher, for them it is dull. They cannot give their heart to that. That's what the dancing does in the lives of people. It preconditions their body that if they don't see that, they don't see anything. But if you go to school and the chemistry class, you know, the teacher is going to teach and before he comes to teach, you know, the drummers come and the children rise up and they dance. And then the mathematics class, before he comes uh, to teach, the children have to rise up and dance. How much chemistry will you understand? How much history will you understand? How much of your subject will you understand? If you don't understand, how do you pass any exam? That's what happens in those assemblies, except there is dancing. They don't want to hear any preacher. How will they understand the word of God? How will they be converted? How will their lives be totally yielded and given unto God? Look at these people. Look at verse 12 now. In verse 12, it says, they take the timbrel and harp, and they rejoice at the sound of the organ. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, they spend their days in wealth, and in a moment, they go down to the grave. Verse 14 tells us, therefore, they say unto God, depart from us. All we want is dancing. All we want is merriment. Depart from us. We desire not the knowledge of thy ways. That's what the dancing does for them. It takes them, it makes them exhibit the baseness of the human nature and makes the people who had known the Lord before backslide. If you know any of uh, the young people and older people who have left our church, honestly and earnestly defending the faith was delivered unto the saints and they have gone into the dancing assemblies and then you you ask them ah, how about uh, you know why did you leave uh, the church you know the church deeper light i like our pastor but you know uh, the service is so dull we just sit down there for hours listening to the bible from cover to cover yes i understand knowledge is good but you know what it in the place I am now since I got there we're free how free are you you're free are you free to serve God are you free from sin we're free are you free from all the lusts of the flesh we're free and then ask them about the things they used to know about where is this my verse of the Bible follow peace with all men and holiness uh, uh, without which no man shall see the Lord yes I used to know that when I was in deeper life but you know honestly honestly I've forgotten where that is in the Bible now 
they don't remember because they do not desire the knowledge of his ways all they want all that catches their attention is the dancing i pray where god has put you you remain here until you see the lord face to face in jesus name you know all the great things happening now in our church i pray you will get your own you know dancing without success why do i need that dancing without victory why do i need that? but the victory of god and the power of god in your life without dancing let those who want to dance let them stay where they are and be dancing but here we're climbing to the mountain top and here we're having the faith, the faith that cannot fail. And every mountain in your life will move away in Jesus' name. Look at that verse 15. There. In verse 15, it says, What is the Almighty that we shall serve him? They're not serving God, only to dance and dance. What is the Almighty that will serve him? And what profit uh, should we have if we pray to him? Look at verse 20. In verse 20, his eyes shall see his destruction. When difficulty comes, it doesn't have faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word words of God. When challenges come, you cannot solve that problem because they entered not in because of unbelief. They are not developing their faith. They are not reading the word of God. They are not getting ready for the coming of the Lord. All they are interested in is dancing and dancing. If you ask them after the service, what did you get in the service today? I mean, those people who are giving to dancing and dancing, I, I don't, don't ask me what I got in the service. I just know I was happy. I just know I exercised myself. In fact, we danced until my legs were paining me. That's all they remember. But here, when we come here and they say, what do you remember? You say, okay, if you are going to listen to what, you know, what I remember, you need to sit down because then you go from Psalm 145 to 146 to 147 to 148 and to 150. You say, not, not, it's not enough. Then you go to Exodus, then you go to Job, then you go to New Testament. That's what I got. How did I pray? This is the way I prayed. You load them up with the word of God that will bring blessing.